Okay, great. Um, so welcome everybody to our next in the series of CPD and 43. Um, this is our talk for ground investigation and geohazards uh, held by Stantec and Jeremy Colton and James Weddle uh, from Stantec. Um, it'd be a really interesting talk to hear about basically about what, what's in the ground, geology, et cetera, and so on. Um, so really, really excited to hear from them. Uh, as usual, please everybody um, think of questions towards the end of, to be asked towards the end of the talk. Um, and we've got a couple of events coming up afterwards. Um, so we've got a talk from uh, Giles Boone, um, who is a chartered member of the Institute and has worked on, recently has worked on the UK's first Passive House Leisure Centre. Uh, St. Sidwell's in uh, Exeter. So really interesting project that he's going to be talking to us about on the 11th of August. So please do, uh, if you're available, please do make sure that you do come along. That's going to be a slightly longer one. So we're allowing an hour for that talk, um, but please do come along. And then after after that, we have a, a event which is scheduled with Cantifix, uh, Solstice Glass, a very specific piece of glass which has been developed with Oxford University uh, for um, uh, well-being, etc. So really interesting again, and that's going to be on Wednesday, the 1st of September. Uh, that's going to be more in line with our usual CPD and 43's timing and schedules. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll be handing it off to uh, James and Jeremy. We'll, both myself and Joe from Syat Wessex um, are here in the background. We're going to mute ourselves and we'll be here to answer anything in the uh, questions um, uh, in the chat box. Uh, so please do let us know if there's anything that you guys need. Um, we'll be popping in any links, appropriate links, etc. as well. Um, so James, Jeremy, um, it's over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Um, so I'm Jeremy, you'll hear from James a, a bit later on. We are both geologists by background, um, but we're going to be talking about ground investigation. Uh, so here's, here's our agenda for the next half an hour. We're going to talk about some of the main legislation and, and planning context applicable to ground conditions and why we're investigating. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the some of the key technical parameters to consider in terms of the objectives, uh, the approaches to how we collect the data and, and undertake the field works. And then James is going to talk about how the data is is managed and the information is communicated between the stakeholders and then how that's applied to some of our works uh, uh, through cavities and geohazards. All right, next slide. So before we start, I'm duty bound to just talk about Stantec quickly. Uh, we're Land Development, Infrastructure and Buildings Consultancy. Um, it's a relatively new name to the UK. It was originated from three pre-existing businesses being Peter Brett Associates, ESI Consulting and MWH and putting all that together we've got this this broad regional coverage um, and in the context of ground engineering we've got around 70 people that work across most of those offices with I'm based in the south uh, and, and James sort of based all over the place really lar largely in the north but but all over. Next slide please. Right uh, so context next slide. So um, yeah, we're going to talk about both um, geotechnical investigation and geoenvironmental investigation um, with geotechnics being the engineering and physical properties of earth materials. So that's sort of foundations, earthworks and slopes, et cetera. And then geoenvironmental being contaminated lands. So that's the environmental properties of soils, water and gases and how they impact human health and the environment. And those two areas are intrinsically linked. So whilst legislation and planning might treat them differently, best practice is always in our view to to consider it all together. In terms of legislation, um, let's click. The key UK legislation on contaminated land is principally part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act, and that provides a regulatory framework for the identification and designation of contaminated land and remediation of the land. Um, it provides a mechanism for statutory intervention for sites that can't be resolved through planning or development. It places duties on the local authority and the primary regulators um, to identify and designate the land. And it led to the contaminated land officer, who's a key consultee that we need to satisfy through our reports and assessments for human health and the agency being the other key consultee for controlled waters. Um, and the, it also introduces the guidance um, around how we undertake those risk assessments, which is through review of pollutant linkages. So that's a linkage between a particular source of contamination, a pathway for migration 
and a receptor. So the investigation has to satisfy the regulators uh, and assess the potential for significant harm. Next slide, please. So in the context of planning, um, the NPPF uh, states that planning decisions should take account of risks that arise from land instability and contamination. It identifies that decisions should be made to help enhance the environment by um, preventing development on land that might be adversely affected by pollution and land instability. And importantly, it sets the principles of suitability for use and betterment to be achieved through planning. And it also identifies that minerals um, require long term conservation and introduces mineral safeguarding areas as, as, a, as a planning consideration. So a key point here is that planning, uh, the NPPF uh, sets out requirements for the investigation to assess whether a site is suitable for use. Uh, another key sort of component of the guidelines is Eurocodes, more applicable to geotechnics. So Eurocode 7 consists of two parts, with part one describing general principles for geotech design, and part two covering the ground investigation. And that includes the, the planning and the reporting and the investigation, the collection and the testing of soil and rock samples, interpretation of test results, and the conversion of test results into derived design values. And it advocates a phased approach for geotechnical investigation and refers specifically to preliminary investigations, for example, to assist with positioning a structure and then design investigations to provide all the detailed design parameters. Next slide. So that was very quick canter through um, some of the key objectives and why we're investigating um, and we're going to talk now about the what, the what and the when. So here's some examples of common geotechnical considerations. So some are sort of bigger, more acute risk items such as collapsible ground and landslide and cavities, but also some of the, the more detailed design based considerations such as pavement design and volume change. And ultimately, the investigation has to assess how all of these parameters relate to development, such as the structures and the highways. And the photo here on the top is an example of a big ground collapse in, in Reading, the sort of thing that James will talk about in a bit. Um, and it's sort of clearly catastrophic and high profile, but there's also a need to remember the need to look at the less obvious issues, perhaps such as the bottom picture, which is an example of ground movement as a result of clay shrinkage. Next slide. Um, so in the context of contaminated land and geoenvironmental considerations, we think about them in the same way. Initially, is the site suitable for use? So not part 2A, but in a planning regime where most of us work, is the site suitable for use? Are there any issues relating to either soil quality, waters or gases that need to be addressed? And is some form of remediation or mitigation necessary? Um, and just to clarify, remediation would be a proactive step to remove a source of contamination, like excavating and removing a hotspot. Whereas mitigation would be actions taken by a developer. So that might be capping a garden, for example. So if remediation or mitigation is necessary, then what's the scope? What are the costs and when will it apply? I.e., is it pre-development remediation or is it pre-occupation mitigation? And then looking beyond those things, other, other more detailed design points to think about might be water supply, pipe work, ground gases and floor slab design and waste classification and disposal. Next slide. Um, so this is just a, a quick think about when some of these things will crop up. So going back to geotechnics. Uh, so if you think about the, the items we looked at previously in, in the context of a typical project life cycle, well, they all have varying significance through the life cycle. So a collapsible ground, will it be absolutely key to identify and assess that as an acquisition stage? It's a, a material planning consideration and clearly it, need, it would need to be addressed through um, delivery as well. But then if you look at some of the other examples, such as the volume change, well, that won't necessarily be a key point for acquisition. It's not a uh, explicitly a planning consideration, but it will be applicable to defining foundation depths. So uh, that would fall in the delivery um, phase and it would be really interested of interest rather to insurers such as the NHBC in the context uh, of a residential development. Next slide. So program wise, this is a key bit of guidance that relates to contaminated land again, um, and this sets out the requirements to consider things as a, as a phase based approach. So we've got these three three stages on the left, um, stage one, two, three, and more often than not with with most ground investigations, we're working across these two areas. So a preliminary risk assessment, which most people would know as a death study. And then the first bit of ground investigation would be what they call as a generic 
quantitative risk assessment. So that's where we're taking samples of soils and waters and we're assessing those to published against published generic assessment criteria. And if exceedances those criteria are recorded, it doesn't mean it's contaminated land, just that further tiers of assessment are needed. And that would be through that top right hand corner initially, which would be a detailed quantitative risk assessment. So that's uh, the use of statistics. And the last point to highlight is the four blue boxes there are, are quite commonly reflected within planning conditions. So often, you know, we're working through a planning consent and needing to clear planning conditions. And typically there might be four stages to those conditions reflected by the need for a death study, the need for a ground investigation, and then if remediation is necessary, remediation strategy, and then delivery through uh, verification at the end of it. Next slide. So uh, mapping that across the REBA stages, the, the, the top row there would be those guidance stages and the, and the left hand column would be REBA stages. So just to show next click that um, again, typically we're working in that um, uh, phase one PRA sort of exercise would be REBA stage one and two, maybe pre-application. The investigations might run both pre and post application through REBA stage two, three and four. And then if we're into remediating and mitigating uh, and potentially verifying and monitoring uh, for some sites, well, that would follow through the through the latter stages. OK, next click. So we've looked at um, the why and the what and, and some of the when. So this now would just be working through some of the how of how the data is collected. So the death study um, is really important. It's got a few functions. It's needed to define, help define the scope of any investigation. It's also the minimum requirement of NPPF in the context of a, of a planning application. So through that death study, we're looking at um, identifying land use history. So we look at historical ordnance survey maps. We might look at the planning portal. There's loads of information on the planning portal from nearby sites. We'll do internet trawls that would might help us look at um, unexploded ordnance risks and, and mining risks. We've got our own internal databases related to cavities that James will touch on as well. Uh, we'll look at the environmental settings, so geology and hydrogeology. Uh, we'll also look at minerals consultation areas. Uh, and that can all be presented as a very, very quick and crude um, assessment of risks and uh, help to inform an investigation scope, or it can be written as a, as a planning focused document. All right, next click. So in terms of the investigation itself, that can be either done through non-intrusive um, approaches or through intrusive digging holes and, and drilling of things. So in terms of non-intrusive techniques, that can include geophysics. It's something we use quite often in the context of um, geohazards. Again, it's really good as a rapid assessment across large areas, it can be limited by things like hard standing and groundwater, but it's very, very good and very powerful in the, in the right approach. And here's an example of uh, a locating a chalk solution feature. Let's click. We also use geomorphological mapping, so that's looking at a site terrain um, with either aerial photographs and uh, a walkover. Typically used um, for looking at land stability risks. Next click. There's also exposure logging. Where we're actually looking directly at um, soil slopes or rock slopes, and this is an example of Plimstock Quarry in Devon, where all the old quarry slopes were scaled and logged by uh, engineering geologists before we designed the rock bolts and netting and uh, rock traps at the bottom of the slopes before a residential development. Next click. And then a newer approach is the use of remote sensing such as INSAR. And this is an example of um, a British Geological Survey uh, report where they were looking at ground deformation beneath uh, mining regions in the northeast. Next click. Right, so that's the non-intrusive. In terms of the intrusive, which is what we all typically think about, um, we've got uh, trial pits and trenches. So this is a slightly unusual example of using a long reach excavator to try and find the edge of a landfill. But you know, more typically it's a JCB sort of excavator and, and uh, we might get six or eight pits done in a day. It might be about a thousand pounds a day. Really good, really quick, but uh, disruptive if we're working in areas of hard standing. So this would be a wind sample rig, um, again, uh, really quite relatively cheap. It's about £1,200 a day. We might get two to four holes done in a day. We can include collection of standard penetration tests and do dynamic probing from that same rig. Um, but there are limitations in terms of the material it can drive through and the depths it can achieve. Let's click. 
dynamic probing. So that can be done off of that window sample rig, or it can also be done off of very small um, modular rigs. Um, that is an approach used just to assess the density or strength of the ground. It's just banging a probe into the ground quite simply and measuring the number of bangs for a given length. Uh, it's quite commonly used in the assessment of geohazards again and cavities. So here's an example of us working with a modular rig inside a building looking for um, cavities risk beneath that building. Let's click. CPT, so that's cone penetration testing. Um, so that measures the uh, electric current and frequencies within the probe pushed into the ground and converts those into engineering parameters. It gives us a continuous profile of the ground. Um, it's commonly applied to geotechnical um, assessment, but actually has applications in contaminated land as well. It's more expensive. It can be two to three thousand pounds a day, but it can do a hundred meters a day. So in the right ground conditions can be very powerful. Let's click uh, cable percussion or shell and auger. Really common, particularly in the UK, less so overseas. So it's based on driving a, a cutting shoe into the ground. It can retrieve both disturbed and undisturbed samples. It might do about 10 metres a day. Um, it might it might be about 1500 pounds a day. Uh, and the collapsed rig there, you'll see them trundling up and down the motorway. It's, it's really mobile, so it's towed behind a four by four vehicle. Let's click. Um, a slightly newer approach that we, we're using a lot now in the southwest in particular is a rotary percussive rig. So it can work in the same basis of driving a, a cutting shoe into the ground, but equally if it hits a hard stratum, it can transfer to a rotary drilling head so it can core through hard stratum and, and, and retrieve full core samples as well. It's a similar cost to a CP rig, a little bit more expensive. Similarly, maybe about 10 metres a day. Most um, exploration contractors now do have rotary percussive rigs as well. Next click. Then going on to more difficult drilling conditions, well, that would go into rotary and even sonic, dr sonic drilling. And there's a whole huge variety of different um, drilling rigs, scales, sizes uh, and cost. This is an example actually of a sonic drilling rig we used recently to drill through uh, a landfill again, where the drilling conditions would have been quite difficult for conventional rigs, so it was able to drill through hard stratum and big bits of timber as well within the waste. Let's click. So a couple of key documents that we refer to and use in delivering ground investigation on the left is the yellow book, the UK specification for uh, ground investigation. So that sets all of the key specification clauses. It provides a pro forma bill of quantities as well. That's actually out for consultation at the moment. So. Uh, a third edition is going to be published um, in the spring next year. And on the right hand side is the conditions of contract, um, which is an ICC condition specific to, um, to ground investigation. And the last few thoughts from me with regards to scope and the balance between cost and value. So that if we think about this is a maybe a typical 10 hectare industrial, former industrial site with a residential lead redevelopment um, scenario. And a typical scope may be for as a preliminary scope might be, say, 35 holes. We might collect, say, three samples per hole, test half of them. So test, say, 50 samples. And that would equate to, if you go to the next click, it would equate to a very small proportion of the soil seen and an even smaller proportion of the soil uh, that gets to the lab and an even smaller proportion that gets tested. So the key point here is that the ground investigation should never be considered as a standard product. That the guidance that refers to a phased approach and an iterative approaches will provide best value. Um, and if you think back to those technical points that we went through previously, um, and each, how each of those change, the importance changes through project life cycle, then that needs to be reflected in the investigation when defining the scope. Uh, so the scope has to be bespoke to the site and also cognizant of the project programme. Let's click. So that was it for me in terms of the why, the what, uh, the when and the how. And this is this is James into data management now. Yeah, so I mean, just leading on really from what Jeremy said there, um, obviously data management, the key the key thing to consider here is all the data coming from those ground investigations and and how, how do we process that and uh, take it forward into reporting and delivering something to the client, which is understandable. Um, so typically, um, the data that we receive from contractors, it will be often in the form of a, a text report, um, normally as a, a ground investigation uh, factual report. 
um, and that factual report will normally be accompanied by AGS data, um, which is um, which has been around since 1991, um, and um, it's been growing through the industry over the years, and it's become a lot more popular now, and is it's, it's fairly widespread. But that's key data essentially, which documents all the field investigations, in, includes laboratory testing, um, the actual borehole information, uh, any monitoring data all in one single file, um, which can be either read in a text format or um, various different softwares utilize it um, in modeling. So that data is absolutely key and you should always make sure that if you're ever doing a ground investigation, you always request copies of the AGS data for from the consultants and uh, it's just useful to have. Um, so currently I believe though we're saying here it's um, AGS 4, I think the most recent is 4.1 um, which is the, the recent update from the Association of Geo uh, Geotechnical and Geovermal Specialists. So I mean all this data feeds into modelling in, in essence and modelling hasn't really changed. I mean this is a sort of example geological model from 1835. I mean, we're still doing the same modeling geologically. We're still, um, I, I, we're not quite so often using coloring pencils as a stereotype of geologists, but uh, um, but now obviously moving forward, we're, we're using more digital technology um, and we're often using programs like LeapFrog, which is a new three-dimensional modeling software and, and various other modeling softwares. And this is kind of an example of the output of current geological modeling tools or all, all the data which goes into these which is absolutely fundamental is the AGS data this is all populated by that AGS data collected in the ground investigation so it's, so it's important that we stress that that data is kind of collected and um, and and monitored throughout the, the development of the project um, and we can build complex models but it's all dependent on the the quantity of data, as Jeremy was pointing out, um, we're, we're actually investigating a very small percentage of the site. So um, you need to obviously understand that geology. So it's, it's absolutely key that you um, spend money building a good understanding of the geology and the geological model. And just some screenshots of this is actually a solution feature at um, uh, Stoke Prior, a, a recent project we've been for a water, uh, water treatment works where it's adjacent to a fairly large ground collapse. Um, so it was particularly useful in this instance to try and understand the complexities of the site in relation to the geology. Um, so moving on to geohazards, um, I mean, we all we all know that uh, the term sinkhole is thrown around quite a lot in the media. Um, and uh, often people um, think that the number of sinkholes is increasing um, and it is indeed increasing and we've seen that uh, trend um, and that growing costs obviously with uh, relation to sinkhole damage and repairs. Um, but it's important to stress that the media are not always right. Um, like for example, this, this sinkhole in Liverpool, it's not a sinkhole geologically speaking. Um, it's just a burst water main which has washed out the fines um, and then obviously the pavements collapse. So, very different kind of source and reason for occurring. Um, so you can have sinkholes sometimes associated with manholes, sewers, I mean water mains as, as it said there, um, historical wells that's quite common actually. Um, so always be careful of historical wells present on your site. Um, they, they do form a ground collapse risk much like a mine shaft would. Um, and yeah and obviously mining activities being another source of sinkholes as well. So true sinkholes, uh, and this is a this is a true sinkhole, maybe not as quite as dramatic um, as maybe everybody imagines sinkholes, but um, essentially it's the dissolution of natural um, carbonates in the ground, or it could be salts or gypsum, um, and, and we obviously have lots of those throughout the UK. Um, and essentially that dissolves at depth and, and then causes the ground collapse into it. Um, and, a, and another source, I mean, is obviously uh, mining related crown holes. We we use the terminology typically, um, but essentially it's the same sort of mechanism at, at play. So long, long term studies um, have identified essentially that the causation of majority of sinkholes is primarily rainfall. 
Um, so increasing rainfall intensities, um, some of like the storms we've recently seen can be attributed to uh, the increasing risk of solution features, sinkholes, um, and leakage of water utilities, which is intrinsically linked to ground movements and subsidence, um, and increasing use of soakaways. I mean, that's quite often we, we've seen in the past, people have emptied their uh, paddling pools into the back garden and triggered a sinkhole. Um, so, um, but the main main reason typically is rainfall. So let's have a look at that. So annually in the UK, this is just a sort of annual rainfall for the whole of the UK, but obviously it fluctuates throughout the year. Um, and there is a growing increase uh, in, in rainfall quantities um, since, well, this is 18, before 1880. So um, but um, the, the key thing is that rainfall anomalies have been increasing as well. So when we're talking about rainfall anomalies, we're talking about those um, intense rainfall events and typically storm systems, which kind of um, stay over a location for a long period of time are slow moving, therefore cause increased amounts of rainfall over a small period uh, of time and over a small area. So. As you can see, if we go back a slide, obviously majority of the rainfall is sort of centred on the um, the western uh, side of the UK, uh, and obviously typically drier to the east. So, and, and then we kind of flick through to these are solution features and the typical distribution of solution features um, from Stantex Cavities database on the right hand side here, the green dots, um, and this is sort of indicates that. Solution features are a lot more widespread um, and they are intrinsically linked to the geology. If you look to the left, the geology is indicating all those um, well, geological units which are susceptible to dissolution. So primarily limestones, um, obviously the chalk um, and, uh, and also other deposits like Triassic salts, um, which is the case for that site in uh, Droitwich that I showed you the, the, the geological model for. Um, but importantly, the Cavities database is, is a record of all historical uh, ground collapses and is the only complete record of those in, in the UK. And, and we often um, sell this data to, um, to water companies and public who are um, doing studies or other consultants doing desk studies on, on, on sites. So, Dissolution. I mean, so how's it formed? Um, so, in this, this is good cross section, sort of showing you the uh, the typical arrangement of. So typically, what's happening is you normally got a clay deposit, and surface water is running off the edge of the clay deposit, and then where it meets the chalk or a limestone, um, then starts to sink through natural discontinuities, uh, and then over time, it widens those discontinuities because um, the uh, slight acidity of the groundwater uh, dissolves the carbonate and that over time forms forms cast um, and eventually goes down to the water table and understanding where the water table is on your site is key to understanding your risk in terms of um, dissolution because as you can see majority of the large dissolution features are above the water table not below the water table it does occur below the water table but primarily above so we'll just look at um, the different types. Um, so these are, um, to the left there, there's a typical cave system um, and, um, and a solution pipe or fissure uh, down the bottom there, and they're sort of highlighted on the cross section there. The, the pipes and fissures are very common, and we often see those on quite a lot of sites. And as you can imagine, when you're doing a site strip, they are normally readily identifiable, especially on the chalk, and where that contrast in colors so so obvious between the chalk and the the, the infill typically, um, and, and swallow holes. So to the left, um, so you'll often see these associated with recent streams or or even um, ephemeral streams, which occur normally when um, we've had heavy rainfall events. Uh, if you see if you see those descending on your site, um, that's definitely a concern. Uh, streams which disappear, uh, it's likely to in indicate a swallow hole. Um, and obviously, yeah, the more well known, that's the typical sinkhole in our mind as geologists. 
This is um, so not all swallow holes and sinkholes are that dramatic. I mean, this is an example of one actually recently and fairly recently in Ripon, the site we've been dealing with for a leisure centre. Um, this was actually triggered by or during the ground investigation by the contractor. Um, and you can see obviously the trees subsided into the feature. It doesn't look that, well, it doesn't look so dramatic as some of the other sinkholes, but uh, in essence, um, this resulted in a, a significant grouting project, which is still ongoing to date, um, and a large compaction grouting project. This is just an example of that uh, same solution feature uh, in Pembrokeshire. Uh, just a view into the cavity. So some are cavities, but many are not cavities. Uh, sometimes they're just infill with material and you can't really see a cavity below the site. So moving on from sinkholes in terms of natural dissolution features, let's move now on to crown holes. Um, so, so crown holes are typically um, terminology which you use in the mining uh, world. And um, it, it's essentially a ground collapse. And this um, sketch here kind of shows the kind of typical arrangement of a crown hole. So normally where you've got superficial deposits um, overlying uh, either chalk or any rock type, it, this could be also in uh, coal mines. Um, and essentially the, the roof collapses and that void slowly migrates up to surface and then causes the collapse of that material to form that crown hole. Uh, that would typically be a void all the way down to the mine workings, but sometimes can be partially infilled as well. Um, these are some pictures of some typical sort of chalk mines and crown holes. So you can see that one in the patio there. That's pretty characteristic of a, a ground collapse or crown hole. Um, it's, it's important to point out in here the metalliferous mines that can be quite different different in the size of the ground crown hole collapses. Sometimes it could be a lot larger or or a lot smaller. So um, and typically formed from stopes, which are stopes is a subvertical uh, ore body which has been mined out quite common in obviously um, the southwest of England, um, but also in any real metalliferous mining areas in Wales, for instance, and things like that. So um, Stantec also has a mine cavities database, um, very similar to the Stantec natural cavities database, where we've got a record of historical mine workings uh, all across the country. And again, uh, this is used by various different uh, bodies we license this data to, um, if they're doing a search or um, death study themselves, if it's another consultant. And these are just kind of some examples of ground collapses of that shaft in, um, which collapsed in Glasgow. Um, and yeah, I mean, as you can see, uh, 1,400 tonnes of grout <laughs> to, to complete that. And it, and also it would have ended up with a, a cap as well. Um, and the, uh, the ground collapse, which is chalk in, uh, in Kent. And just some other pictures of other sites, not ones that I've been involved in. Um, this is one that uh, Stantic was involved in before I joined them. Um, and essentially it's, it's a large sinkhole, which was which in the end, this was corrected with um, foam concrete and compaction grouting. And uh, just a few other uh, sinkhole investigations, again, infilled with uh, foamed concrete. And you can kind of see the the investigation, uh, some photos of the investigation there just with the uh, rotary rig and also the cable percussion rig in the background there as well. So, um, I mean, in terms of, I mean, whilst we we obviously uh, do the ground investigation and everything like that, and, and normally most people think of JITEX as, as people who come in and do the ground investigation and are not seen again. Um, that's not always the case. Um, in this instance, this is the, the same leisure centre in Ripon um, where we installed um, instrumentation into the reinforced concrete slab, uh, the raft foundation, um, to essentially um, monitor the foundation, um, well, into perpetuity. Um, so these, these were extensometers that we installed through the raft foundation. Their intent is essentially to monitor the raft um, through its design life and um, if another ground collapse were to occur essentially um, migrating up from depth then the extensometers which are 
vertically mounted would sense that ground movement as it migrates to surface and give an early warning to to the client that um, potentially um, the the foundation might be at risk and there might need to be some some need for further uh, investigation or consolidation works. Just some, uh, this is just obviously the extensometer getting embedded in the raft foundation. I think this was a 750 mil raft. Um, and obviously, it's a key part of um, all of this. It had to be integrated with the ME systems within the building and, um, and obviously the electrical systems in particular because um, it was mains powered. Um, so uh, we needed to sort of interact with those teams, which is not normally. Um, something which happens with GTX working with with those teams, but um, it does when we're dealing with instrumentation instrumentation of this sort. It's more commonly seen on on dams. So so jumping now onto the regulatory framework from a sort of ground stability point of view. Um, as Jeremy's pointed out, I mean, the the main ones um, just for ground investigation. Um, are HBC and and the uh, national planning policy framework um, so we have to we have to follow that and uh, it's obviously one of the key key pieces of guidance that we uh, uh, require to follow um, in for sites which are on coal um, we also have to consider the coal authority um, obviously they own on behalf of the UK, all all the relic coal mines mostly. Um, obviously, some are still in private ownership, but most are not. Um, but the coal authority have to be consulted as a statutory quantity in planning um, for any sites which are over and above mine workings or might be potentially affected by mine workings, depending on the nature of the development. Normally, it has to be something which involves um, a residential element to the development or a building. Uh, it might not be needed for, say, for a bus stop or a, um, a, uh, a landscape area or something like that. So they, they also deal with mine, mine water pollution um, and those risks as well, which can impact sites. Um, and like I say, it's, it's managed on behalf of the, the UK. Um, they are slowly becoming more increasingly involved with metalliferous mines as well. Uh, and just to mention the Syria guidance, it's, it's a good document uh, to reference if you do have a site which is above my, abandoned mine workings of any nature, chalk, coal, metalliferous. It, it gives a real great breakdown of sort of um, the processes and that, that we will go through and, and obviously um, need to understand ultimately in terms of ground investigation. So well worth a read if you do end up with a site which has got those uh, geohazards present. So just a hand back to Jeremy on that note. Yeah, well, just to, yeah, I'll just uh, summarise really. I mean, there's quite quite a lot to pack into half an hour, um, <laughs> but we went through quickly through the, some of the context, you know, the planning and legislation and guidance as to why why we're doing the investigation, and then we looked at the objectives uh, and the program as to what's triggered and when, uh, how it's done, some of the typical uh, approaches in the field, and then James went through managing the data. And then how that's applied as some of the, the challenges around geohazards specifically. So that's it in summary. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that, Jeremy and James. That's uh, really insightful. Um, uh, I'd encourage any, anyone to ha that has any questions um, to to post them into the chat box. I can see there's some been some interesting discussion about one of the sites uh, that you showed a picture of, the one in Hemel. Um, uh, I was I was thinking uh, you briefly mentioned about grouting and uh, capping and foam concrete etc. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear about what you basically how you can add further sort of information to so the brief um, uh, notes that you mentioned on remedial um, actions to uh, fissures and casts and uh, yeah. uh, so on. Sure. I mean, t typically um, we, we often get call outs and it's normally it's after the fact. It's, it's normally after a sinkhole or ground collapse has occurred. So um, and normally we'll get a call out and nine times out of ten we'll normally end up doing a, a 
preliminary investigation of the ground collapse. Um, so that might be probing uh, using dynamic probes to try and define the extents primarily to see what is impacted. We'll assess any structures which are adjacent um, for cracking and instability and try and define how far uh, from from the ground collapse is it influenced. Um, so, so that's a key thing. And then obviously um, following that ground investigation, we'll normally then decide, OK, well, what's the best solution to treat this feature? Some some instances it might just be it's a ground collapse in the garden, which is most often the case, um, mm -hmm. which is not covered under insurances. Um, so we will often end up with the recommendation that the the, the, as the client can't um, pay, they often not. It's a private individual. They'll they won't really want to pay for a, a treatment of that feature. They'll quite often go down the route of just infilling the feature with a gravel or a granular inert gra granular fill and and just monitor it. Um, so that's quite often the case. But other instances where um, the insurance company can become involved, um, then we will often recommend it's compaction grouted so that's essentially uh, drilling um, into the ground and injecting concrete as bulbs under pressure at different elevations um, so from the bottom upwards essentially compacting okay. between those individual injection points the, the granular material to primarily stop that migration of the void to surface um, and then it will obviously the cavity will get infilled with foam concrete uh, at the surface uh, normally, mm -hmm. normally, in, normally we'll fill the the cavity first. It, it'll either be gravel will be placed in the cavity on the surface, so you can get access, or foam concrete, one of the two. So um, uh, uh, we've had a, qu a question in from um, Catherine. Uh, are there certain areas of the country that are more likely to suffer from ground collapse? Yes, definitely. Um, obviously, um, ground collapse is, is is varied. I mean, it's it's all dependent on the geology you're on. So, um, if you're on the chalk and you're, um, say, for instance, on the edge of the chalk near or adjacent to the interface with the the Lambus Group, um, we call it, um, that's a particular zone of um, uh, known karstic instability, um, mm. and therefore it. There are hazard maps that you can be generated in those zones to try and aid you in citing your development. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's probably an example for the chalk, but there are obviously um, other areas of the country, like on the gypsum formations and things like that, where um, it's actually um, through the planning process, it's already been defined those areas which you would require to do. Um, increased ground investigation, or it might be a, you might have to go through additional planning processes. Right. Okay. Is there any? Is it particular areas? So is it southeast, northeast, northwest, southwest? Was is there, or is it more more localized than that? It, it's well, it's it's localized on the geology, so mm. it will follow the the chalk. Um, and um, if we're talking about the chalk, is it probably the best example? Um, it, it's normally within one to two hundred meters of that interface with the Lambeth Group. Um. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. It depends on obviously your groundwater regime and things like that as well. If you've got a shallow groundwater regime, it's probably less likely. Um, mm. But um, if it's at depth, then there's yeah, there's there's high potential. You've got solution features um, already present on the site. Uh, you may have partly answered this, but uh, we've got a question from Cody. Who ends up with the liability on these urban car sinkholes? Is there any sort of subsurface instability insurance, or is this? Or is the homeowner dependent on preliminary geotech reports? Or, for example, is it covered under standard home insurance and so on? It's, it can be covered under standard home insurance if they take out um, the you can take out specific policies is my understanding which cover your garden as well uh, mm -hmm. for the risk of substance um, but um, obviously the main structure of the building will probably be covered but you'd have to make sure the policy would definitely covering for that um, eventuality um, does, does that kind of answer it yeah I believe so yeah, yeah. and we've got another question from Sam uh, uh, oh sorry that's uh, are you are you uh, well I might as well ask it um uh, I, we didn't clarify but are you uh, in a position to provide CPD, CPD certificates or is that something that you would uh, refrain yeah, from? yeah I, I, don't, I don't think we are actually so I, okay that's fine great. I was hoping that would come through yourself as well uh, well we don't we we don't provide them to be honest um so um uh, Sam unfortunately um uh, you won't be getting one um uh, 
but if you have any further questions for Jeremy or James and you want to discuss with them anything uh, privately of, of any projects that you're working on, please do get in touch. Uh, you could obviously see their contact details on the screen. Um, we've got a question from Lee. Um, do you get involved with cracking to existing buildings and possible solutions where foundations may be at fault? Yeah, I mean, Ripon is probably a prime example of that. Um, the uh, We've got an instance in, in the leisure centre there that um, the, the building's been suffering from ground movements. The existing building, this is, was suffering from ground movements uh, prior to developer the the, uh, the leisure centre. Um, and um, there was cracking across the building already. And um, it, it's definitely recommended in that instance so you go and do a detailed structural survey. And quite often you'll install telltales on the structure to, to monitor it over a period of time, or it might be instrumentation. In the case of Ripon, we uh, installed um, specialist instrumentation around the building to measure its level um, as we were grouting underneath it. Uh, so we could see as we injected grout into the ground, that bulb of pressure uh, was not influencing the foundations of the existing building. So yeah, he, he, I think that answers that one, does it? Yeah, definitely. I think um, uh, I think we'll leave it there. We've had a few questions from uh, the attendees and uh, we're getting quickly on to sort of two o'clock. So I think uh, we'll bring it to a close. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Thank you very much, James. It's really informative. Um, please do. Um, uh, if, you, if anyone does have any queries or questions, please do uh, direct them towards uh, James or Jeremy. Uh, obviously, at SIAT Wessex, we've uh, organised this event for everyone that's in attendance. Uh, uh, it, this will be made available on the YouTube channel in due course. Uh, so please do look there if you would like to refer back to this event. Um, if you have any suggestions for any other events moving forward, please do let us know. Um, likewise, uh, please do sign up for our future events, particularly one from Gail and Snowden. She be really interesting is the UK's first passive house leisure centre um, so it should be extremely interesting to discuss from a technical understanding of how that was even achieved um, and then obviously thereafter we've got one from Cantifix which is about sol solstice glass so please do um, sign up and we look forward to seeing you then uh, again thank you very much everybody thank you very much James and Jeremy and uh, thank you uh, Joe for supporting um, and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks Bye very now. much. Bye-bye. Cheers.